everybody here? Hands up if you're not here. Okay, that happens occasionally. Welcome everybody to the Ecology, Cosmos and Consciousness Lecture Series at the wonderful October Gallery. Um, this is a regular lecture series. We're coming up for our fourth year next month, in fact. And it's, uh, for those of you who haven't been before, it's the last Tuesday of every month, more or less, um, themes uh, coming under the, the, the massive canvas of ecology, cosmos, and consciousness. Basically anything I deem to be fun and interesting. <laughs> uh, can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. So... That's another one. People can't hear you. I know, no, that hands still people can't hear me. Yeah, that's a classic as well. Um, just a, a little few plugs before we get started. So next month, uh, last Tuesday in November, it's got me, don't worry. Um, we have a discussion about 2012, the Mayan calendar, uh, time wave zero, and the, the, the eschaton and all that. With not, uh, one of our speakers is here already, he's come early, prepared for the end of the world, yeah, that's Jairus. Um, hopefully we'll also have Daniel Pinchbeck with us by Skype. Um, we'll also have uh, Andy Lecter, uh, the author of Shroom, and um, Cameron Adams as well, who helped me organise, uh, well, we helped organise together, the Breaking Convention Psychedelic Conference, which I have to tell you is going to be on again next year at the University of Greenwich in July. So I'm going to put that in your calendar, 12th to the 14th of July. Um, also the organisers of our, the Breaking Convention Psychedelic Conference, myself, Cameron Adams, um, who else? Ben Sessa, and a few other people have got together, and there's an event coming up in the middle of November, two or three weeks time, called Regeneration in Notting Hill. Um, you can find out more about that the information if you join our Facebook group. I don't want to force anybody to join Facebook. Don't join on my behalf, but if you happen to be on there, please do kind of join our group. Uh, so without further ado, I introduce tonight's uh, speaker. He's come all the way from the States, um, but he is actually a kind of native of, of this island. He comes from Wales originally. Uh, however, uh, on the course of his uh, kind of journey so far, he ended up becoming an ordained Tibetan Lama. Um, but Mike has many talents, he's a real renaissance man, he's a musician, a, 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 a acclaimed composer, uh, he's, a, uh, he's also an explorer of entheogens, uh, an etymologist, a uh, scholar of Sanskrit and Tibetan, uh, a great cook, and I'm, I've heard also an athletic sexual lover. <laughs> uh, if I miss anything out, there's probably a few more other things besides. Uh, and Mike has just completed a book on the secret drugs of Buddhism. That's right, I was going to say yeah. the secret book, secret books of Druidism. <laughs> That's the next book. Uh, <laughs> and he's going to talk to you about that tonight. So please join me in giving Mike a very warm welcome. Yeah. <laughs> that turns me off. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you like that? Have I on? Yes. Yeah, good. All right, well, um, okay, we, um, how many people here know of, I have one hands up, know of the, uh, the ancient Vedic use of drugs as documented in the Rig Veda? Summer. Summer, well done. Summer. It's, um, yeah, okay, quick background. The, the Rig Veda is a book of chants which are used by Brahmin priests of Wur when they conducted something called the Agni Hotri or the fire sacrifice. And they, how do I, how do I uh, page up in this? Oh, there it goes. Okay, right. Um, and these uh, these were uh, priests were this priestly caste of the Aryan um, uh, people who migrated into north western India around 2000 BC, 2500 to 2000 BC, and they brought a, a kind of religion with them, which was based around, as this lady so rightly says, a drug called Soma. Soma comes from a Sanskrit root, su meaning to, to press, to crush. And so it means that which is pressed down, basically juice. 
So with no more clues than it being called juice, we're trying to figure out what it is. But there are a lot more clues, and there's, they, they, they talk about it in various terms. And in, um, um, in this ritual, they would actually make the, the juice in the ritual, grinding something between stones, adding water or milk, offering some to the flames in which the gods partake of the, 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 um, the, the sacrament as well. And they pass it around among the priests, all the priests have a cup, and then they have a, it ends up with a freestyle rapping contest. Um, and I'm not joking. And they think that's how the Rig Veda originated, in these, um, in these spontaneous expressions of, uh, of ecstasy which the, the priests went into, and they, except they did it in meter. And so, um, many people have, uh, have speculated on what this soma was. It was given many different um, synonyms in the, in the Rig Veda. It was called various things like uh, Shukla, the, the clear one, or uh, Sukra, uh, or Amrita. Um, Mre means to die. Mrita means death. Amrita means no death. In other words, immortality. So um, Amrita is the elixir of immortality. Um, it is, uh, some of the suggestions for Soma have been um, ephedra, also known as mahwan or Mormon tea. It's, uh, it contains an amphetamine. Uh, but some of the, some of the writings um, seem to describe a state which is much more ecstatic than that can, which could be attained with mere ephedra. Um, it's not to, the, the, to denigrate the, the claims of ephedra, it's still called hom or som in some places in Central Asia. So uh, apparently it was soma for some people. But if you look in the Yajur Veda, uh, a little later text of the same people, you can see that the, they describe uh, the god Rudra the red one, or the howling one, or the weeping one. You can translate it a number of ways. Um, all of which um, seem to be appropriate for the use of Amanita muscaria as a sacrament. The, the Amanita muscaria mushroom is the familiar fairy tale illustration mushroom with the, the red cap and white spots. It is a, um, it's a very strange drug. It uh, doesn't seem to, to be in a group with anything else. It's all out on its own. It's, it, um, it affects the cholinergic system and so makes you cry, hence like the relevance of uh, Weeper for Rudra and his bright red, of course. I don't know about the howling part so much, but they, they, some of those who, who take it in Siberia do indeed howl. Um, they, the Yajur Veda, though, also mentions uh, uh, as well as the red rudras, which are seen in plural, they are multitudes of rudras are seen. So, um, but where it's obviously not just a single god. They also mention the um, the blue necked rudras. There's the red ones and there's the blue necked ones, and they are commonly seen by the girls that draw water from the well and the guys, the the youths that tend the cows. Mm -hmm. And so it's, um, it, it's beginning to look as if the, the, the blue-necked ones may be connected with the, um, the mushrooms which grow on cow dung, Psilocybe cubensis. So if we, we fast forward a bit to um, the the years uh, between 500 and uh, uh, BC and the beginning of the Common Era, we see the rise of um, Puranas. These are texts that, uh, which are um, compendiums of ancient tales. Purana means ancient. And in it, we, we get more mentions of 
the uh, the sacred drug, Amrita. Oh, I should say that um, around 1000 BC we get these these texts called Brahmanas, which are commentaries on the Vedas, and uh, the, like the Aitare Brahmana, the Shatapada Brahmana, they and the early part of the in the, the Brahmanas, the early Brahmanas say, uh, be very careful dealing with the Soma dealer. Yeah, obviously, the, the Soma comes from somewhere beyond their range, the range of these Aryan people. Um, they, it comes from the mountains, they say this a lot. So, the text says, be careful, the Soma dealer is a cheat. The Soma dealer is a thief. Here is the ritual for, for procuring Soma. Make sure that it is good Soma because you, you know, that it's so common that people get ripped off and cheated. And then, and then we go to the later Brahmanas and they say, these are the acceptable substitutes for Soma. So we know that Soma was dying out. The actual, the real Soma was becoming scarcer and scarcer until they, they, uh, they, they found substitutes. So the substitutes are very interesting. They describe a vine called Soma Lata, the Soma Creeper, Soma Vine, which I think may actually be Algeria nervosa, which contains lysergic amides and it is native to Eastern India. But, but as I say, we go forward of, you know, uh, about um, 1,500, 2,000 years and we find the rise of the Puranas and these seem to be about an entirely different um, race of gods. These, the Vedic gods are like the European gods. Really, they're, they're really cognate with them. They, Indra is really Zeus. Varuna is Avanas. Um, the, um, the Ashvins are Castor and Pollux. They're exact parallels. But the Indian, the really indigenous Indian gods like Shiva, Krishna, Durga, uh, Kali, they are uh, they're completely different um, uh, origins. And their the, the legends begin to be compiled. And in several instances of these Puranas, they mention a specific myth, a myth about the churning of the ocean, the event which made Amrita. And so, um, in this, in this, um, this myth, the, the gods keep repeatedly being beaten by the titans. You can imagine that, and it is it is hypothesized that the the gods rep the devas represented the gods of the Aryan um, invaders, and the titans, the asuras, were the gods of the indigenous people, these um, denigrated people known as Panis or the various like derogatory words in Sanskrit for these other people, and that you had to buy some from, and so the. Um, Several, several uh, Puranas, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, they all tell you the story of the churning of the ocean. It must have been a very important myth. And they have variants. They all have different variations. But in it, there is, uh, they, all these various beautiful things come out of the ocean. And the final thing is the world's first physician carrying a pot of soma or Amrita, the elixir of immortality. There's a byproduct, a terrible poison, which Shiva decides to drink, and he holds it in his throat. There's various reasons for him holding it in his throat. The one I like is that his wife, Parvati, says, no, don't swallow it, and puts a hand at the base of his throat, and then Vishnu says, and don't spit it out either, and slaps his hand <laughs> over his mouth. And so he has to hold it there, and it turns his throat blue. Well, and so, this is how Shiva gets his, his most familiar epithet, which is Nila Kanta. Nila Kanta means blue throat, literally, but Kanta also means, like with a wine glass, it's the stem. It's like anything, any narrow place by which you would pick something up. It is also cognate with, linguistically related to, derived from the same root as the word Kanta, without the um, retroflex N and palatal T without the little dots beneath the, the letters it means stem or branch so we're told then 
that this explains why Shiva is called um, Blue Stem. I personally don't believe it. I think it's called Blue Stem because Shiva is the mushroom, so as to be convinced, which turns, the stem turns blue after you've picked it because the bruising causes an enzymatic degradation of, of psilocin into psilocin oxide. And psilocin oxide is dark blue. Um, I think that is why, uh, that's where the, the Nila Kanta uh, that term comes from originally. But Shiva is not the only Nila Kanta. He, um, the, the, the term blue throat is also used for a peacock because he has a blue throat. But the funny thing is that they, in, in, um, in Indian folklore, it says that the peacock is poisonous. You can't eat peacock meat because he swallowed the poison at the churning of the ocean. So he is, in other words, peacocks and Shiva are the same thing and really the mushroom. Uh, so let's have a look at... Um, oh. So here um, I'm, I'm going to show you uh, the... Oh, oh yes, I didn't complete the little story about how they got the, the, the uh, posteriors handed to them by the Asuras. And they, they, went to, they went to Vishnu and said, what are we going to do? We're so demoralized, we keep getting beaten by the Asuras. And Vishnu said, well, you've got to have a joint project with them. You've got to like, um, do some, some thing that will benefit you both. And so they decided to churn the ocean, which was in those days made of milk. And, and here we see uh, Mount Mandara, this, this mountain with lots of little um, uh, trees growing on it. They were various herbs and, and medicinal plants. Um, and they wrapped the king of the Naga spirits around it three and a half times. This is incorrect, it should be three and a half times. And here we have if we have the Asuras, it says Asura above them, and it says, uh, above these, it says Deva, Shiva, Vishnu, Brahma. So, and uh, <coughs> Vishnu is also the turtle at the bottom, he is the, the pivot for the, the churning of the ocean. So they hauled it back and forth for a few thousand years, until the, the snake, the Naga, got extremely <coughs> sick, and he vomited up the, this, this poison which she would drink. So, um, yes, yeah, so we have this, this strange uh, notion that um, the peacocks are poisonous because they were the ones that, um, that absorbed the, the um, world-destroying poison. At the time of the churning of the ocean. Now, in the in there seems to have some, there been something strange that happened around the seventh century or so. Um, Buddhism, which had been completely atheistic and uh, had no room for gods at all, suddenly acquired hundreds of gods, or at least dozens. Um, and they were all variants of Hindu gods. Um, it, like Avalokiteshvara, for instance, Chenrezy in Tibetan. Um, he is a borrowing from Shiva. He has Shiva's blue throat. He has various um, attributes which he carries which come directly from Shiva. Now, this is a representation of one of the forms of Tara you see that she is actually sitting on a peacock and riding a, a peacock. And at, in her form as Mahamayuri, the great peahen, um, she uh, is capable of eating poison and turning it into Amrita, the elixir of immortality, which um, is, uh, as we have seen, a synonym for Soma. Um, the, that is to say, in the Vedas it was a synonym for Soma. I actually uh, believe that it came to mean, um, it came to mean the Sivasabi, 
uh, mushroom rather more than the the Amanita muscaria mushroom. But here we see a um, a Japanese a medieval Japanese print in which. Um, there are four vases of Amrita. This is a mandala of, uh, of um, Amrita here. We have four vases at the corners. And in the middle, Mahamayuri sitting on a, um, on a peacock, which is the same shape as the vases. It's showing the similarity of, of the vases of Amrita. There is um, an, another thing is in in modern um, modern Vajrayana Buddhism, um, we have we still use Amrita, but it's just a coloured water. It doesn't really, uh, with lots of blessings, but it doesn't really um, have anything psychedelic in it. But um, always, always insert it into the top of the flask of, of so-called Amrita is a spray of peacock feathers. Um, we we find that um, there is um, I should mention about Vajrayana Buddhism that the Vajrayana practices, the tantric practices, the sadhanas are not available to everyone. You must be initiated first, and you have to qualify for the initiations by doing a certain amount of practice. And in the initiation, you're given a dose of Amrita. Um, the writings on Amrita uh, make it quite obvious that it is supposed to be um, psychoactive. Um, and uh, the initiation is in three phases, um, which um, correspond to the phases of activity of the drug. This is covered in other chapters of my book, I won't go into it now, but um, uh, one of the things that the initiation qualifies you to do is to take part in a tantric feast or Gana Chakra. And the first thing you do in the Gana Chakra is drink Amrita. So um, it's quite the, the substance is quite central to the practice of Vajrayana. Oh, also we see that, um, for instance, I'm going to see if I can find this illustration. Um, there is a there's a deity. You can't find it so far. Okay, there's a deity called Vajra Bhairava who who. Um, Why buffaloes? Water buffaloes? What's, uh, what's special about them? Well, it just so happens that there is a particularly potent species of psilocybin mushroom called Pani well, psilocybin mushroom called Paniolus cambogeniensis. It grows only on the dung of water buffaloes and nowhere else. Um, it is strange that um, the sometimes this um, this deity with a buffalo's head doesn't ride a buffalo, but rides a peacock instead. Uh, here we see uh, we see the well-known deity Amitabha, who is carrying a um, a begging bowl. In the begging bowl, there is a flask of Amrita uh, with a red flaming jewel above it. The, it's difficult to see, but there are four stylized streams of Amrita flowing out of that flask. It is an overflowing flask. How do we know this? Because all like, Vajrayana paintings, Tibetan religious paintings, are um, painted according to a script. They are all uh, derived from a written sadhana. We don't have to look at the painting and say, well, I think that looks like something or other. You just look up the text and find out what it is. And so it describes quite clearly, this is a flask of Amrita and there are four streams coming out of it. The throne, as we can see, is supported by two peacocks. Um, his name, um, Amitabha, is usually explained as infinite light. Amitabha. 
in, um, in Sanskrit, literally not measure light or radiance. Um, a very great authority on Buddhist iconography, Professor Chandra, Lokesh Chandra, um, has pointed out that the name is actually not Sanskrit at all, but Prakrit, and that the Amita part is, is, is um, Prakrit for Amrita. So this, his name means the radiance of um, Amrita, uh, the sacred psychedelic sacrament. They, um, his, and, and, and to somewhat underline that, that if you, you know, if you don't like believe Professor Chandra's word, his long mantra is called the Ten Amrita Mantras, uh, mantra because they, the word Amrita occurs ten times in his mantra. Um, oh, and here, one of the, one of the um, great things that came out of the churning of the ocean is Surabi, the wish-granting cow. Um, and we know that the Amanita, sorry, the Silosabi uh, mushroom uh, grows on cow dung. And, and so we would expect, if it is, if we are talking about the Silosabi cubensis mushroom as being Amrita, you would expect cows to be associated with it. Uh, like, for instance, Shiva's vehicle, his vahana, is Nandi, the bull. Nandi meaning joy. And, um, and so here we see the cow with wings and a peacock's tail. Um, um, we, and in the Gama Chakra that I mentioned, the sacred feast, one drinks a concoction of five Amritas, five, the fivefold Amrita, uh, Pancha Amrita. Pancha Amrita is actually, the, the Pancha means five, Amrita, uh, elixir of immortality. So, Pancha Amrita is the fivefold immortality. This has come down to us in English as the word punch, meaning a mixed drink. Um, now, um, in, in the, the, the later Buddhist tantras, we have this fivefold concoction which we drink in the, the Gana Chakra, and also five meats. You have one of, uh, you have a nibble of each of these five meats, and they are, they're described as being the meat of cow, dog, horse, elephant, and human. Now, I can't really believe this is taken literally for, um, I mean, not only do, do I not believe that, that pious Buddhists would be expected to, to become cannibals every month when they practice their regular Gana Chakra, but where are you going to get an elephant every month? I mean, even if you could get human meat, I mean, you're supposed to be practicing this, these rituals in a cemetery, in a graveyard, where there would be you know, freshly cooked arms and legs lying around, you're not going to get an elephant every month. They're expensive. So, um, I really believe that these meats are the raw materials for the Amritas, for the fivefold Amrita. These will be the mushrooms and whatever else that they, they put into it. One of the reasons I think this is that in some versions, it's not cow at all, but peacock. And so the meats are peacock, dog, horse, uh, etc. And so, um, the only way in which I think peacock could taste like cow is if they're both the same mushroom. The mushroom that grows out of, of a cow pet and has a blue stalk or blue neck like a peacock and so it's called Nilakanda. So, um, is that live? Should I, should I cut it off there and well, have uh, questions? Uh, it's up to you, Mike. Uh, you can keep going for uh, a little bit longer if you like. You haven't been going for... Uh, I'd still like to point one thing out. Yeah. Is this... It, it's, it's either it's got its two tails, or one of those tails is the wishes coming out. No, um, it's got two tails. All right. And she also... She is also sometimes shown with women's breasts as well as the other. Um, it's quite a confusing creature. She's, uh, yeah, the Kamadenu or, or Surabi. She has two names. So, um, 
in, all right, I'll, I'll give you another little thing. There's a, uh, there's a Tibetan version of the churning of the ocean. And in this case, um, the reason for the churning of the ocean is the, is the dreadful poison that's, that's about in the world. It starts off with the, what is a byproduct in the other one. So this poison is around, and, they, and the Buddhas get together, decide to churn the ocean and make Amrita. And they make the Amrita, give the world supply of Amrita to um, this, this mild-mannered golden bodhisattva called Vajrapani, who is just like this quiet guy, golden color, wearing, you know, usual bodhisattva robes, and, and he just happens to carry this little golden thunderbolt around with him for some reason. Um, oh, uh, this guy originated mythologically as a yaksha, uh, a goblin, but I will go into that now. Yakshas show up in this quite a lot, these cathartic creatures that live underground and emerge from time to time, somewhat like mushrooms. So, he, um, he's given this, this part of Amrita to look after, like, take care of this, the Buddha say, it's all we got, the world supply. So, but for some reason, he doesn't keep a uh, close watch on it because there's this demon called Rahu, who a demon who causes eclipses, um, and he uh, he is jealously watching this part of Amrita until um, Vajrapani toddles off somewhere. He I don't know maybe he's gone down the betting shop or something I don't know, but he's but a but Rahu takes his chance, he dives in and drinks the entire world supply of Sama. He's not satisfied with that, he adds insult to injury. He replaces it with his own urine. And then when Vajrapani uh, comes back and discovers it, of course all hell breaks loose and the, and the Buddhas say, Naughty Vajrapani, for that you've got to drink his urine. And he drinks his urine and turns into this dark blue creature with surrounded by flames and with swollen red eyes and, um, and an intense dislike of demons. So he goes running off after, after Rahu and he blasts him with his, uh, with his thunderbolt and like completely explodes him. And the Buddhas go, no, no, it's not a nice Bodhisattva action, is it? Really, you know, you're supposed to be all loving and compassionate. Now you just go and put him back together again. And so he puts him back together, but he finds too many parts. And he's got, so he ends up with ten heads. The top one is a crow. Can't find his legs at all, so he uses the, the bottom half of a giant naga, a giant snake. And he's got eyes all over his body and a, and a um, face in his belly. Um, yeah, so uh, there's, he, has a, he has a parasol too, he has, he has well, not a parasol, a flag, that's right, it's a banner, but it's not like a flappy like, um, flag that we're pennant, like we would call a flag. These, these um, banners of victory, Dvaja, they were held up in battle after, after uh, an Indian, Indian armies have been fighting, when one was defeated. The, the victor would raise this, this um, banner of victory called the Dvaja, or a um, Jaya Dvaja, which victory banner. And, and it's like an um, umbrella with a skirt around it, basically. It's kind of like a, a, a mushroom. And it's, um, um, but the one that he holds up is made of Makara skin. It's a Makara Dvaja, and Makara is a sea monster. So I was scratching my head for ages, and I'm saying, I'm sure this is significant. Why on earth would they call it a Makara? I'll find a picture of it for you, what I'm saying. Uh, why would they call it a sea monster uh, banner? Um, there has to be a reason for that. And so, um, I was looking up the mythology of Makaras and their iconography, and I just couldn't find anything other. well. Um, and let me see, um, I think it might be, oh, it might be the, the, oh, I think it's in Tibet, no, oh, no, damn it, they, and then it dawned on me when I was, uh, I was 
like writing about the five things that begin with M. Um, this is something that is used in, in Hindu tantric rituals. They have the five things that begin with M. They're called the Panchamakara. And it, it just dawned on me that, that it's a... Um, ma makara and Makara are very, are very close. And it can easily be just a pun. And this is the... Um, using a, the banner could be the, a reference to a mushroom. By the way, no Sanskrit word for mushroom. You have to say parasol or, um, or umbrella. Chatra or Atapatra. It's Sanskrit has a huge vocabulary, a really huge, and yet there's not one word. You either say parasol, umbrella, or use a, like a poetic circumlocution, like Uchilindra, the the um, sprouting wormy thing. <laughs> um, so. Um, um, yeah, so it occurred to me that, oh, uh, we'll come back to him. It occurred to me that these, um, that they could mean, if this is a, if the Dvaja is a mushroom, it could be the mushroom that begins with M, or with something to do with it that begins with M. And one thing that begins with M is what he replaced the summer with. Urine, mutri. Mutri in Sanskrit is urine. So I think you're saying the, the urine mushroom. Here, um, oh, I, I, I don't know if any, it, I, silly me, I just assume that everyone is, so is, is familiar with the, the, the physiology of, and the pharmacology of the, of, um, like the uptake and metabolizing of uh, muscimol and ebotenic acid, which is found in, in the Amanita muscaria mushroom. Well, um, the active principle, the thing that gets you high, is called muscimol. But there's a lot of ebotenic acid there as well, which is um, somewhat intoxicating, but mostly toxic. And um, when you eat it, your liver actually converts a lot of the ebotenic acid into muscimol. So the person who drinks your urine after it, you've eaten it is actually going to get a better trip than you. <laughs> um, so, um, and so here we see a, um, a Tibetan version of Ganesha called Authority Averting Ganesha, or Ganapati to be strictly correct, with his consort, who is a monkey, a female monkey, there's a funny business here. Um, so, um, who is drinking a stream of wish-granting gems from his penis. Um, and, the, um, and the only uh, authors who have actually written this up and commented on it say that she is belating him. I do not believe that. They were not, they, they were not shy about showing such things and that, that is not an erection. Here we have a one-legged demon surrounded by wish-granting gems. And, oh, damn, I, I, do, I really don't know where that is. I'm looking for something and I thought I would find it. But, um, so I have a picture of, uh, of Ram, who is a rather splendid picture. But uh, the thing is that he, I think I mentioned he, that he has ten heads. And the top one is a raven. There is a strong connection between ravens and Amanita muscaria in Central Asian mythology. In, um, in Afghanistan, the Amanita muscaria mushroom is called Aish al Harab, which means raven's bread. Um, and there is still a, a, um, a fly agaric Amanita muscaria cult in Afghanistan. Um, and it's quite possible that the, that the um, Aryan people picked up the use of the, that, that mushroom in their migration through that area when the, the, the Andronovo culture like, migrated through what is called the BMAC, the Bactrian Margiana Archaeological Complex. Um, but that's really prehistoric um, and quite speculative, but, um, but I think um, that's... Uh, um, oh, 
Another little note about the, about the peacocks. Um, it, the, the, in the 11th century in Rajasthan, there was a monastic order of uh, a Shivite monastic order known as the stoned peacocks, the intoxicated peacocks. And I, I think uh, uh, the, the word that was used was Madhya, uh, Madhya Mayuri. And that Madhya could actually mean um, like an elephant in rut. It does not necessarily mean intoxicated with, um, with a drug or alcohol. Um, and so it could be interpreted as the, the, um, the, the, like the lovesick peacocks, but I think that would only be the cover story if anyone like, probed too deeply. But, they, but uh, I think it's fairly, uh, um, it seems fairly obvious to me through the, the, the you know, scraps of data that I've provided you and some various other things that uh, I could go into at length if you had the right questions, We've, that the peacocks uh, represent a st blue staining psilocybe mushroom, whether it's, it's uh, psilocybe cubensis or Paneolus cambogeniensis, they seem to have been characterized as peacocks in iconography and legend in uh, both Hinduism and Buddhism. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'll we'll take questions. Thank you, Dan, Mike, that's brilliant. Um, we'll open up the floor for some questions now for uh, a small while. I'll just take the first prerogative, but I can give you a chance to think about your questions. If I can, that's uh, my catchphrase. Um, so at what point did the kind of medication stop and the meditation stop, or what point did the medication get supplanted? For me, meditation. Oh, you. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the um, well, uh, actually, it's like in the, it's in the the um, the fifth century. We see the the. Um, sudden arrival of tantras, these scriptures, which um, um, are very, very mysterious. Uh, they, they are written on many levels at once. They are what people call like multivalent or polysemic. They, they have many levels of meaning. And it's my, um, it's my guess that in many cases when they're talking about sex, they really mean a psychedelic experience, and that they they are hiding this in um, in um, layers and layers of of um, symbols and puns, lots of puns. Um, so we don't know where it came from, but we know about when it started, and um, we know that it was also. It began to be taught. These uh, these tantras were, and their rituals began to be taught at the great Buddhist universities, the Mahaviharas like Vikramashila and Nalanda, in the early part of the seventh century. Um, it's it's remained a mystery where all these gods came from. Where how how come there was this Shivite? Um, influx into Mahayana Buddhism. And I have, I have a guess, I have a kind of hypothesis. There was uh, this important Shivite leader, he, he led a group of Kapalikas, the skull bearers, um, an important group of, they carried, they carried a um, the, the top of someone's skull as a skull cup and a staff that um, like these are the only two things they owned the, the, the cup and the staff um, and they covered themselves in ash like spores um, so anyway these guys um, they were led by this guy called Lakulisha um, Lord of the Club is what that means like, don't ask me and, um, and the early statues we see of him are sitting um, with his um, right leg on top of his left and his hands in with, you know, the, the left leg on top of the right, a left hand on top of the right. That's not the Buddhist way, that's the Hindu way. And so uh, later, the, later in his life, there are statues of him in the Buddhist teaching uh, posture, 
and sitting in the, the Buddhist lotus position. So, you can surmise then that he was converted to Buddhism. How would that happen as he was an important leader of these, these Shivites? Well, in those days, uh, the, if you debated someone, uh, you, ha you, you risked being defeated, and if you were defeated, you had to convert. You had to convert to the, to the, uh, to the system of the guy that defeated you. And what's more, if you had any students, they all, all had to convert as well. And so if Lakulisha was beaten by a Buddhist debater, he would have had all these hundreds, maybe thousands of followers who would be dragged kicking and screaming into the Buddhist camp, bringing all their Shivite practices with them. That's just a guess from my part of where these, you know, where, where the meditation stopped and the medication began. Although, the, the, the meditation doesn't stop. It's, um, um, before you can qualify for the tantric initiation, you have to prove yourself a pretty um, uh, competent meditator and go jump through a bunch of hoops first. But that's, you know, that, that, that's my um, understanding, my, my best guess about, about the historical background. Thank you, Mike. Have you got any other questions then? Do you want to... Yes, I would like to ask you, so, so, uh, so your inspiration for those theories was obviously your personal experience with intelligence, yeah, with those substances. Can yeah. you tell us about your uh, background a little bit? I'm interesting because you are a Buddhist. Uh -huh. yeah, a I discovered Buddhism, man. You can read it in the book. It's actually, it's actually, you don't have to pay money to find that, but the bio chapter will tell you all about that. And I discovered psychedelics and Buddhism around the same time. Um, so what's the, before you ask for that, the, the second question would be, so what's the situation at the moment? Is it Buddhist taking, you know, in secret? In secret, you know, like, uh, they don't want to tell us that they are doing psychedelics? Ah, oh, um, and this is very interesting. Um, uh, I knew um, Chudram Trumpa Rinpoche uh, when he lived in England. And he would say, and he did take psychedelics, he took LSD, I know. And he, he criticized hippies for not taking it properly, not with a, <laughs> without doing it with enough, you know, like concentration and uh, respect. He also said that there were more powerful things in Tibet. And he also told people, you should stop taking LSD. Or he, he said to, you know, various uptight, like bourgeois, uh, you know, Middle class Buddhists. I think you should take LSD. <laughs> he was, um, but I know my teacher told me that um, that Trumper was not prepared to divulge the, all the secrets of Tantra because people in the West would misuse them. And I think um, I suspect he might have me meant the um, the. Um, the use of real Amrita and not just the colored water. I have some quotes in the beginning of the book, and there is a Tibetan doctor in Kathmandu who says, well, we have uh, mushrooms in Tibet which uh, bring ecstasy to the body and awakening to the mind. Um, so um, they do know about it. And, um, that there's a tradition of using them. It's difficult to say, but I very much suspect that there is. They just haven't let us in on the, on the, 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 the complete deal. And I speak as a lama. You know, I think I'm still one of the outsiders. I, I'm not divulging anything that I've, I've learned from the tradition that was secret. There are things, there are some things that I, in initiations, where I've gone, wait a minute. I understand the symbolism here. It's about mushrooms, but I can't tell you that because it's secret. I've been, I've taken vows. Um, but I think there are things, and like in particular, in the body mandala of Chakra Samhara, the initiation, they're actually instructing you on how to identify the mushroom. And if, if you know, if you extrapolate back to what the Sanskrit original said, because you know you're told in Tibetan now. Um, yeah, um, it's uh, very difficult to say whether anybody really does it anymore. So can I uh, ask one yeah. more? 
so as a Buddhist monk, you, you do... You no, do no, 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 I'm not a monk. You're not a monk. But no, 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 I'm a lama. Yeah? Lama, uh, so yes, so yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So you are a meditator. Yes. So can you tell me, uh, did you have any experience close to psychedelics experience uh, uh, through the you know, use of any substances? Do you have anything similar in your own experience? Oh, yeah. Yes? Yeah, and, but they augment each other, you know, they, they really, they, you know, meditation helps you tri and trivial So you have an experience so profound during uh -huh. meditation, uh -huh. right? during the, the white light, absolutely, uh -huh. yeah. So, uh, okay. That's a lot of questions. I'm moving on. Yeah, um, I should talk about Buddhism and its origin. We're talking about the Vedas, Hinduism, and then from there the historical Buddha, who's someone who separates himself from the, the understanding right. of those of the 80s and any That is people. the standard. That's the standard story. That's yeah. the standard story. Theravada Buddhism, which still exists today. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Well, well, it starts to... It's, it's not quite the same as Hinayana well, Buddhism. Okay. Well, we're talking about meditation. But a, yes, a go technique, ahead. Uh, a, a technique of, of balance of the, of, the, of, the, of the middle part. But what you were mentioning also was of Tibetan Buddhism. Now, as I understand Tibetan Buddhism, and how Buddhism is, is taken back into Hinduism is that with, with Tibetan Buddhism, Buddhism you have the shamanistic origins. Ah, uh, no, origin. no, I don't know. I think this is a big mis misunderstanding, and Terence McKenna is responsible for a lot of misunderstanding about this. Like a lot of people believe that the all the the um, the colourful deities and stuff in Tibetan Buddhism is comes from Bud from Central Asian shamanism. Absolutely untrue. No, it all comes from India. And, and if you don't believe me, look at the deities of Shingon Buddhism in Japan. They have no input from uh, Tibetan shamanism, and they have the same deities. But Zen and Taoism is much... No, 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 not Zen. Shingon. Yeah, Shingon. Zen, Zen is, is closer to the original uh, technique of Buddhism, which is not connected to the deities. What I'm trying to suggest mm -hmm. is is that, you know, I, I'm quite fascinated by the idea of the psychedelic origins. I, I think there's very little doubt that there is some psychedelic origins to shamanism, religion, but the pure technique of meditation is separate from any involvement in psychedelics. It's generally accepted. It's not separate in the, in the initiation. Well, uh, you're talking about Tibetan Buddhism again. You're talking no, about I'm Tibetan talking about Indian Buddhism. I'm talking about Vajrayana. Well, not, not the pure school that you spoke about. Well, I don't know what's meant by pure. Well, you're saying atheism. Now, no, yeah. God, no deity, no projections, yeah. no, no deities. But was so, there a Buddha? Was there a Buddha? Well, accepted, if it's accepted that there was a Buddha. Uh, I think of this. There was an, in the same way that there's not a Jesus, or there is, it, 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 it allows itself I mean, Christianity does the same thing. It assumes as it travels around, grabs pagan belief systems... And assimilates them. Yeah, and assimilates them. But, th in this, in this think of this. Buddhism had to do the same thing. Think of this. Um, um, the art of Buddhism. The earliest art. Have you ever seen any of the earliest art of Buddhism? Where's the Buddha? He's not shown. He's not there. There are all these people looking at a space under a tree. They're looking at a mushroom or a wheel, or a pair of footprints. Um, and if you look at the, the, um, uh, the, the life story, the supposed life story of the Buddha, born of a uh, son of a king, mother died when he was born. Um, he gets great prophecies about him being a world-ruling emperor or a, uh, a, a great religious leader, spiritual leader, and, and his father says, how am I stopping being a spiritual leader? And, they, and the, the wise men say, well, you've got to keep him away from the world, entertain him, keep him distracted, and so on. Eventually, he, is, he breaks out of, the, of the, um, uh, the palace and goes to become uh, um, a meditator. He goes to meditate in the forest. Who am I talking about? The Buddha, Gautama, or Mahavira, the leader of the Jains? You can't tell because they have exactly the same story. So, um, so it, could it be possible then that the the Buddha is not actually a historical figure, the creator of pure Buddhism, but is is a a tradition of wisdom, like Homer. Nobody believes that, uh, that Homer existed, 
that now is just a tradition of storytelling. Lao Tzu in China, most modern scholars don't believe that there was an actual person called Lao Tzu. His name, an ancient baby, it can be just like what the old guys say. It's um, you know the old tradition. Of ideas. Yeah, but but the philosophy that, that arises two thousand years BC is a philosophy which is no longer just a pronunciation or a creation of deities, but a technique, a psychological technique, which separates from the, the idea of illusion of of Maya of uh, of falling into projections. So there is a technique which does continue to this day. So we have the passion which is, is, is very far removed from what we understand. And Shamata. Vipassana and Shamata are both like the very large, you know, compendiums of, of do meditation. Do you see a connection with that? Sorry, Julia, can you some more questions, please? Sorry, just that. Do you but, see, the final question, do you see a connection with that? Well, you seem to be thinking that they, that what I'm suggesting is that we just take drugs and then we get enlightened. No, no, no. no. There are meditations involved. And what I'm suggesting is that there may have been a, uh, a because, I, I mean, what I was saying about the Mahavira, the founder of Jain, um, is, is also said to have lived at the same time as the Buddha. Um, but he has the same biography, and the early Jains and the early Buddhists use the same symbols, the same, the wheel, the umbrella, the, the footprints, the nandipada, these, and I have tried to find out where these come from. And, uh, you know, the Buddha is supposed to be lived, lived 500 BC, same as Mahavira. You can take these 2,000 years earlier and find them on the seals of the Indus Valley civilization. It's quite possible that these, and also I find that these symbols that they use are related to mushrooms. It is quite possible that, these, that this was a tradition of mushroom-inspired wisdom, uh, that the, um, it, the, the Buddha wasn't given a form until the Greeks of Gandhara, this is in Kandahar in Afghanistan now, they, it was left behind by Alexander the Great, it was a Greek kingdom, lasted about a thousand years, they became Buddhists. They had like coins with Heracles on one side, the Buddha on the other. They were, was, uh, but they were the first ones that showed it as a physical being. Um, up to then, I think it was just received wisdom. Uh, possibly. I mean, I'm just putting this out there as a... Uh, but you should not believe that the, the instructions for using the, uh, the, the Amrita are, um, are separate from meditation. You are instructed on how to meditate while taking it. This and the um, and the meditations on the deities, being a deity, is considered a form of shamatha meditation. Um, and you know, shamatha is tranquility meditation, which is you know basically learning to to focus the mind and hold it in one place for um, you know f uh, from a few seconds to several hours. But um, uh, I don't see a separation between these. Yes, there were um, there were different schools. This Vajrayana is different from what you might call Paramitayana. But you know, even in the Theravada, which you brought up, it, they, even they had a branch of the Theravada which used psychedelics. It's called Vaidya, and it's still found in Burma. But these days in Burma, the Waitzia practitioners are village shamans. Uh, but um, there is, there, there, uh, they, it was a much more um, um, elevated uh, tradition in earlier centuries. But it, it is there too in what we might call pure Buddhism uh, in the Theravada. Uh, Julia, you can go in the discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. There's a few more people to ask questions. So. Um, yeah, you. I, uh, I'm quite intrigued by the five-fold Amrita because it's, it's a five-fold elixir of mortality. It sounds like a very powerful concussion. And uh, you did talk about the cow and the peacock being possibly a representation of a symbol of uh, uh, cubensis. And I wonder if we have any suggestions or any ideas for the other performance. Ah, yes. Um, the number five presumably comes from Shiva. Uh, it's, it's important in the, in the cult of Shiva. Um, 
But um, the the other substances um, are a little more difficult to pin down. I'm, I'm, um, I have a range of suspects, but none that I can actually. I think the uh, uh, the vine um, known as Hawaiian baby woodrose these days, but it's really from India. It should be called Bengali baby woodrose, uh, Algeria nervosa. Then there are a few other. There's a few <coughs> other plants too. Um, uh, what are the properties? Oh, uh, Algeria nervosa, nervosa is. Um, is somewhat like LSD, not quite as potent. It's about a tenth as potent in its pure form. Uh, but rather than being a, so, a slight stimulant as LSD is, it is something of a sedative. So that you are pretty much um, um, lying on the couch for the entire experience. There's a considerable um, quality of couch lock about it, but it's a very potent psychedelic. <laughs> Um, uh, other things may have been cannabis, it has been suggested, um, and because that would have been known at the, the late date that we are talking about. Um, some people have asked me about opium, was that used? I'm pretty sure it wasn't. It's, um, it wasn't included in the, the Ayurvedic pharmacopoeia until a very late date, Spena, they call it Spena. Um, but it's it's more likely that something like datura might have been used. There's um, there are some stories told of the Mahasiddhas, the greatly accomplished ones, the great adepts. These are the early um, practitioners of this this cult, Vajrayana. Actually, some of these Mahasiddhas are shared with Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, like um, the guy called Luipa, as a Buddhist Mahasiddha, is also known as Matsyendranath, who is one of the founders of the Nut tradition of um, of uh, Hindu Tantra. And the, if you are familiar with the um, with the chakra teachings that you'll find in any any uh, New Age bookstore these days. That, that arrangement of chakras and those colours, those the numbers of petals and channels and everything, all come from Matsyendra Nut and his nut tradition. Um, but one of these one of these um, uh, common shared uh, gurus that are shared between the Vajrayana Buddhists and the uh, nut um, uh, Hindus, Shivites, is someone who's known as Gorakshanat in um, in in uh, Hindu practice and as uh, Jalantaripa in uh, Buddhism, and it said that um, he gave this king a mantra to to defeat his enemies, and the king forgot the mantra, and he was so pissed off he went back and he buried uh, Jalantaripa in a pit in the ground. A year later, his, uh, his student, Krishna Charya, comes like through town and he's going, have you seen my teacher? He came, I know he came this way, but I've kind of lost track of him. And they went, oh, the king buried him. And he was like, oh, no, you've got to dig him up again. And, they, and so they, eventually they, they dig him up. He persuades some, there's a rich woman to persuade the king to dig him up. And they dig him up and he's, he's totally comatose, but he's still alive. He's put himself into deep samadhi to survive this. And so they take from his belt his two bags of cannabis and datura and they wave them under his nose. And, he's, and he goes, oh, drugs? And, sits up. And, and he comes back. So we know that these guys used cannabis and datura as well. But you also find mention of things like betel nut and camphor. Um, camphor is, um, is something of a stimulant and causes horripilation. I love that word. It means goose flesh, makes your, your, your hair stand on end. And um, and both betel and uh, and camphor were considered aphrodisiacs. In some um, internalizations of the fire um, sacrifice, when they became 
internal yoga, they imagined that there was camphor in the uh, in the, on the crown chakra, and then a fire coming up the central channel, which melts it and dr and it drips into the hearth and makes the fire blaze up. So I'm wondering if that isn't really about uh, a real external process where people would, would pour camphor onto the flames and cause everybody be breathing in camphor, vapor and getting high. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, there are a bunch of different drugs mentioned in the texts. It's more difficult to pull out the, the references to the ones that are only symbolically referred to, uh, like the, 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 the five meats. Um, I would suspect that horse might be a mushroom that grows on horse dung and so on, but um, I know that psilocybe grows on elephant dung, and so that might be considered a different kind of, uh, of fungus. Oh, in regard to that, in both Buddhism and Hinduism, um, tantric practitioners are known as eaters of dung and drinkers of urine. <laughs> and so we can see that the eaters of dung refers to eating psilocybe mushrooms which grow from a cowpack. Drinkers of urine, users of Amanita muscaria. Uh, the question here then, you, you've got. Yeah. Um, it's interesting because there is a very old superstition to never have peacock feathers on stage or anywhere in the theatre. Uh -huh. It is a very serious superstition. If any designer or or somebody with a hat came with a peacock feather, it would be considered extremely bad omen. Yes, I have I have heard that. I, yes, I, I, I know that. from my background that this is the case, and that is the first ever explanation as to why that would be. I love uh, yeah. I'd love to work out the connection, but if there is any, but I, I but I I you know there are lots of peacock traditions too. Um, uh, yes. Oh, sorry. I was, I, I was kind of confused when you were talking at the very beginning, and you were saying that the soma is the amanita, and yeah. then and then Jiva has the poison and has the blue throat, and that's the the, the cubensis. Right. So why one poison, one is soma? I, mean, I don't think one is poison, and one is soma, but. Um, I'm not sure why they said it was poison that caused the blueness, um, because amanita is a lot more toxic than psilocybe. Exactly. Yeah, but it's quite clear from an early stage they thought, oh well, they're both mushrooms; they'll both work as soma. Um, and there is a certain amount of confusion, conflation between the two things. And I've even seen it in this country when mushrooms were on sale in head shops um, when that was legal. I have seen head shops showing um, a sign in their window that says, we have magic mushrooms, but the picture they show is Amanita muscaria, because it's a more vivid image, and it's, um, it's eye-catching. So, um, even when we know that we're not going to be there to buy Amanita muscaria, that is the picture they show. So, I, I think there's a lot of... Um, uh, migration of, of imagery between the, the, the two mushrooms. It's a very good point though, and I do think that the, the, um, the philosophy mushroom was the mushroom of the indigenous people of India. I think there's evidence for its use by the Indus Valley Civilization. There is a uh, professor, Irthavan Mahadevan, he is one of the great like, uh, experts on the Indus Valley Civilization, has examined over a thousand seals which contain one particular symbol. And, and after examining over a thousand of these seals, he came to the conclusion that it was a sieve for a sacramental drink. And I, my guess is that, because it is pretty mushroom-shaped, this <laughs> sieve, that the, the, the drink was a mushroom decoction and very likely uh, psilocybe. Um, and I believe that the, the invaders who came from Central Asia, uh, skirting the Pamirs, uh, brought with them the red fly agaric mushroom, red and white, that uh, they had encountered in, uh, along the Pamir uh, mountains and the Hindu Kush, um, uh, something that grows in association with trees at high 
altitudes and which was dying out in India. Uh, so I think that, that they, they, they abandoned that one and said that one's getting hard to, to, to get hold of. We will take this other soma that is also a mushroom. And so a lot of the old epithets and a lot of the old verses still applied to the new stuff. And in the, the Yajur Veda, the white Yajur Veda, which is a little later than the Rig Veda, we do see reference to both of them, the red and the blue-throated, as both being a kind of Rudra. Um, yes? Can we start with one last question? Very, very Are you able to tell us um, how Amanita should be prepared for ingestion? Oh, you because should not eat them fresh. Yeah. Definitely, but be very, very careful eating Amanita muscaria. Um, be careful, first off, that you've got the right species. And you don't want other Amanitas. You certainly don't want to eat Amanita verna, Freudis, or, um, or any of the highly toxic ones. Amanita caesarea is delicious. It's completely... Uh, Do they all look alike? They, they look much. very similar, yeah. but you've got to be very careful. So. <laughs> Amanita pantherina is like muscaria but more potent, but they should always be dried thoroughly or boiled to decarboxylate the ebotenic acid. So, um, or uh, feed them to your reindeer and drink the. Most caramelized in the same places where you've seen them in camps. Oh, yes. In the birch woods Ah, and yes. This it has that effect of making things very small and very large. Uh, macropsia, it's, it's, it, has, it causes both macropsia and micropsia. That, uh, like, yes, Lewis Carroll probably read about it in a book called Seven Sisters of Sleep. Um, it's thought that he would have read that because he had seven sisters and he was an insomniac. And, uh, and so. Uh, because of the sisters? No, 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 no. Just quite briefly, no. Um, yeah, um, his original version of the book was the stem that made you taller, the cap that made you shorter, not one side or the other. Um, yeah, so anything else that was... Mike, uh, thank you. I'd like to carry on. We can carry on the talk afterwards, so please do stay for a glass of wine in the chat. Um, I'm afraid that we haven't got any punch. Uh, <laughs> my advice would be that, yeah, thank you for the detour of the cannabis and the and the wood rose and uh, the mushroom, but easy on the camper. Easy on right. the camper. <laughs> um, otherwise you're going to have a bit of a weird weekend. Uh, anyway, so there'll be more talks coming up. i just quickly uh, make an announcement this will be here and give out some flyers. It's not something I'm organising, but it does look brilliant. It's on lucid dreaming and our body experiences. Uh, some flyers back around from David here, he's going to give them out at the end. And that's oh, next weekend. Next, week. next, week. next, week. next week. Can I turn out plug this book? Please stand, of course. Oh, yeah. um, the, 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 the book, the whole thing, and that was just like part of a chapter, the, but the whole thing is available at secretdrugs.net. So that's it. Secret Drugs of Buddhism. I'll put a link on the uh, Facebook group. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Um, and you want to make a quick yes, announcement? Um, most people probably know, but down in the courtyard, there is a brilliant stone black sculpture. Well, it, it, creates music, it's a, it's a Stonehenge instrument, and Flinton here, who's one of the sculptors who helped bring it here, is here today, so anyone who wants to go out, it's in the court game. Three lessons. Three lessons. Three lessons. Uh, be a just to hear this stone, this ancient stone. Some ancient rock music in the court yard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 and we're pleased to be here, Michael, a very warm